Hi, everybody. Good morning. My name is Damon Pike. <clears throat> I'm a principal and I lead the U.S. International Trade and Customs Practice for BDO. We're the fifth largest global accounting firm and have actually been enmeshed in this uh, issue for quite a few years now. So let me uh, go ahead and just set the scene with uh, ESG. I think unless you've been living in a cave for the last couple of years, you know that stands for Environmental, Social and Governments governance. It's kind of a global movement that has really taken off. And it really has been started, I think, and embraced by younger people who are now taking the lead at many corporations. And so we applaud them for this initiative. And basically, they want uh, their companies, either stakeholders, shareholders, or customers, they want companies to act in a socially responsible way and have ethical values that align with their own. Forced labor is probably the most prominent example of ESG that is a that is a global uh, issue, and it touches on not only the social part of ESG, but also the uh, the governance part. So if we can turn to the slides. Uh, my colleague Blythe Newton will be turning the pages, just like our, our Vanna here. Vanna White, thank you. Let's go to the first page, the first slide on ESG. Um, for some reason, I don't know why, but in the United States, with this new law, the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act, U.S. Customs and Border Protection, which is the agency that regulates imports, has been charged with uh, enforcing this law. It's not really a natural part of what customs does. And as you'll hear from my colleagues outside the U.S., uh, customs is not really the lead agency. But nonetheless, here we are in the United States dealing with U.S. Customs and the new UFLPA or UFLPA as we're trying to get everyone to say, because it's a government acronym. So we have to let that roll right off your tongue. So Blythe, next slide, we'll go over what is forced labor. <clears throat> I think many people don't really, I mean, you can envision what in your mind, what you think forced labor involves, those examples of um, like child sweatshops in Bangladesh making garments years ago that were all over the news. That's a good example of forced labor. But the example I like to give is when I was younger, <clears throat> I lived in Germany did a lot of traveling around Europe. And sometimes when I check into a hotel, somebody would ask me to give up my passport because they didn't want me stiffing them on the bill with, you know, without getting my passport back. So if you translate that into the factory context, if workers are forced to give up their identity documents, notwithstanding the fact that they might work in the most gleaming, new, beautiful factory with ideal working conditions, that's still forced labor. So there's a lot of indicia of forced labor. You can look at the uh, website, website of the International Labor Organization for the 11 indicators. But overall, um, forced labor is not always easy to detect, and it's not always what you think it is. Next slide. So um, this new law that we have that I just mentioned, Yofulpa, went to effect about a year ago. And I guess just at the outset, I'll say, even though the law has been in effect for, the, for a year now, over a year, Companies have been, I would say, somewhat slow to embrace their compliance with this new law because they don't know where to start. It's really kind of an overwhelming prospect to think that now, for the first time, importers in the United States really have to trace their entire supply chain because this new law doesn't apply to just the tier one suppliers from which the importers are purchasing, but from their suppliers and their supplier suppliers and so on, all the way back to the source raw materials. And that's the dilemma. So that's why this law is unlike anything else we've ever seen before, because it doesn't, it doesn't just apply to the finished good, it applies to every raw material used in making the finished good, whether that's in Xinjiang, China, the region which is targeted by this new law, or any other part of China, or anywhere else in the world. So it really does require global supply chain mapping end to end, start to finish comprehensively for the first time. There are certain entities that, which have been known to use forced labor. And there is a, a Department of Homeland Security website link here that we've given you, which lists all of the entities. So I'm assuming that everybody on this call as part of their ongoing due diligence and, and uh, compliance efforts has visited that website to make sure that at least at a, at a bare minimum, you're not purchasing from these entities. And of course, there are certain commodities which are well known to be involved with forced labor, cotton, tomatoes, polysilicon, and we'll go over some more uh, in a few minutes. But go ahead, next slide. <clears throat> so by the way, this new, this new law is unusual in that it also applies a legal presumption. Previously, we had and still have withhold release orders on goods from other countries 
which give the importer a chance to rebut information that may or may not uh, prove the evidence of forced labor. But with this new law, it is a legal presumption that if the government, get, that is customs, gets wind to the fact that you have been using forced labor, they will apply a legal presumption that the goods you are attempting to import into the United States are made with forced labor, and you must prove the negative. And that's not an easy thing, speaking as a lawyer, and I know we have other attorneys on the phone, proving a legal negative is is quite a quite a task. But in order to do this, you have to show, and it's listed here on the screen, what you what that you fully complied with CBP's policies and regulations on forced labor. You've responded to all inquiries, et cetera. And then the standard is clear and convincing evidence um, that you've overcome this presumption. And I think on the right, you'll see what you really have to do. You have to demonstrate that you've exercised due, due diligence. And my colleague, Andrea, is going to speak to that in more detail. But that really involves monitoring of, uh, well, first of all, onboarding of suppliers, monitoring to show that you really are keeping track of where these raw materials are coming from because supply chains change over time. New, old suppliers go, new ones come on. And so all that has to be monitored very closely to make sure that there are no uh, violations of this law. Next slide. Um, these are the consequences listed here. The main consequence, of course, if you don't overcome that legal presumption is that your goods will be detained and ultimately seized by US Customs. So you will lose the value not only of that shipment and that container, but most likely all subsequent shipments from that same supplier. Additionally, one of the things that many, many people know on the call here is that if you're a member of our, our US Customs, Customs Trade Partnership Against Terrorism, you will essentially be kicked out of that program which applies, which provides many benefits for importers. We won't go into detail here. But of course, the other thing, as many, many of you read in the news with Nike and Uniqlo, you have reputational harm that follows, which is also does also uh, also does not set well with shareholders, at least for publicly held companies. Next slide. So if you go to the CBP website, <clears throat> there are some statistics here uh, about what's happening. And I think the, the theme here in keeping with the, the permanence of ESG and the fact that ESG is not going away, neither is enforcement of this new law. Um, as I mentioned, this is a new law for customs. It's not something that they normally have as part of their mission, which is revenue collection and trade enforcement. But there is a whole new office at U.S. Customs Headquarters dedicated to enforcing this. There are many, many job openings now um, in, as part of all of the ongoing um, audits and other types of activities that U.S. Customs engages in. They are asking about forced labor and what companies are doing to comply with UFOPA. <laughs> and you can see from here the statistics, um, the, the number of shipments that CBP continues to detain is escalating. These statistics are updated uh, monthly, uh, maybe quarterly, but in any event, we're almost up to $2 billion in goods that have been withheld so far. And of those, you can see that uh, a good third of them have been denied entry, meaning that those companies did not overcome the legal presumption and another third and a half did. So um, these statistics are very helpful. In addition, on the next slide, they also talk about the kinds of merchandise that's being held up. And this is the questions that we get all the time. If I'm in such and such an industry, do I have a chance of getting hit? And we have this guideline to go by. Obviously, electronics is by far the highest uh, uh, industry group of merchandise that's been targeted, as well as industrial manufacturing materials followed by apparel, footwear, and textiles. So anything with polysilicon, uh, cotton, uh, any type of uh, earth minerals that are used in making types of many types of products. These are high on the list for enforcement and will continue to be for the foreseeable future. Next slide. So the last thing I'm going to mention on enforcement is something that's actually pretty significant. Many of you heard that our United States Senate Finance Committee launched a probe into automakers involving uh, forced labor some of you on the call may be in the automotive industry, and that's one of the ones that mo that is most under the microscope, not only because of the Senate Finance Committee investigation, but also because of the categories of merchandise that I just mentioned. So these uh, 
this all this originally was an investigation into the top eight automakers. They sent a request to the top uh, tier one suppliers to those automotive big eight. And so all of these companies are still under investigation. Most of these are, of course, being handled by in-house counsel, those companies. And we're, uh, as of today, we still don't have a final Senate report that's been issued. But I think um, watch out for that in the news. There, there will be some uh, items that will grab some headlines when that report is released. And again, it just underscores the, the uh, nature of enforcement in the United States. It's not going away. It's continuing to escalate and it's broad and across the board for many industries. So that's the update from the U.S. side. I'm going to pause here and turn it over to my colleague, Charmaine Gadaris in Canada. Over to you, Charmaine. Great. Uh, thanks very much, Damon. Hello, everyone, and thank you uh, to SourceMap for the invitation to speak today. Uh, as Damon said, my name is Charmaine Gadaris. I'm a director in our indirect tax practice. Uh, specifically, I lead the Customs International Trade Practice here in Canada. So, as with many countries around the world, Canada is party to the eight fundamental conventions of the International Labor Organization on Fundamental Labor Rights including Forced Labor Convention, the Abolition of Forced Labor Convention, and the Worst Forms of Child Labor Convention, and it is determined to contribute to the fight against modern slavery. As such, Bill S-211, known as the Fighting Against Forced Labor and Child Labor and Supply Chains Act and to amend the Customs Tariff Act, has received royal assent and will soon be enacted. This is the topic of my next four slides, including what it means for our Canadian importers, resident or non-resident, and next steps to ensure compliance. There was an original attempt to enforce similar concepts in 2020 as part of the Kuzma or USMCA, or as Damon calls it, USIMCA implementation, but did not include formal reporting to the Canadian government and focused on forced labor, not child labor. There was minimal enforcement of the attempt, and there was actually only one investigation by the Canada Border Services Agency, or CBSA, um, and it was dismissed. Enter B, Bill S-211. That is a mouthful all the time. So S-211 comes into effect on January 1, 2024. Um, and any entities, which I'll talk and describe a little bit more on the next slide, are required to file a report to the Canadian federal government and must do so on or by May 31st, 2024. To date, there's been no formal templates released by the government for the report, only a listing of the specific information that must be addressed. In short, it's a high level report of how a company addresses and mitigates forced labor or child labor in its supply chains. The fines for non-compliance for filing this report are hefty, and there is actually a potential personal liability for officers and directors of the company. I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on this slide it's for informational purposes. And as I understand, each of you will receive a copy of the recording and the PowerPoint presentation. Um, what this slide does is specifically describes who is required to create and file a report and submit it to the Canadian federal government by May 31st, 2024. Now the second part of S211. This part expands the existing import bans to specifically cover and define child labor, whether coerced or not, and introduces a new definition of forced labor. The definitions adopt and expand on the definitions in the International Labor Organization's Forced Labor Convention and worst forms of child labor convention. In addition, the definitions in the IOL conventions, child labor is going to be defined to include labor or services provided by persons under the age of 18, and that will be contrary to Canadian law. I think it's important to note here um, that the it's also going to be a contravention to sell or dispose of goods in Canada that have been deemed to have been manufactured with forced or child labor. This is a pretty wide net that could capture Canadian distributors and retailers who were not the original importer of the goods into Canada. 
The CBSA or Canada Border Services Agency will be charged with enforcing the revised sections of each act. And along with increased searches of the Canadian border at the time of entry of goods, it is expected that CBSA will ramp up their post-entry verification process to include situations where goods may be manufactured with forced or child labor. So your takeaways, what do you need to do? You need to fully understand what uh, S211 entails and what it means for your company. Um, you're gonna need clear documented uh, processes throughout your supply chain. Uh, how are you gonna do that? Stay informed. Um, I'm sure many of you on the, the call are, are aware. Um, Canada is in a slight bit of turmoil at the moment. And you know, if there was for, by chance a change in government, this particular S211 could also change as well. So stay, stay on top of that. Um, there's obviously a soft supplier software mapping out there. I suggest that you use it and absolutely make this a priority to your organization. This is not going away. This is a, a global coming together um, to enforce uh, this and similar types of legislations. And what's your output going to be? Um, your reports to the Canadian government. Um, I suggest you enroll in PIP, uh, which is an acronym for Partners in Protection, is similar to the CTPAT uh, program that Damon mentioned earlier, and also create a contingency plan. Um, the global landscape, uh, the international trade landscape is very, very wavy and rocky at the moment, and, and you need to be able to pivot uh, at a moment's notice. So with that, uh, I am going to hand it over to my colleague Guillermo in Mexico. Thank you very much. Thank you, Germaine. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being with us today. Uh, I'm going to speak about uh, the Mexican perspective of the forced labor issue. As you may aware of, uh, on February 17, 2023, the Mexican government published a resolution prohibiting on the import of goods made in whole or in part with forced labor. This resolution became in effect May 18. <clears throat> um, here in Mexico, the Ministry of Labor is going to be in charge of the investigations. Uh, but in my opinion, at the end of the, the the time, they have to, to work with uh, the custom, the Mexican customs, because uh, I think it's, it's also a customs issue, not only a labor issue, but let, let's see what, why, why they uh, assume the, the labor is the correct one. So on the other hand, the resolution, do not does not impose any due diligence requirements on the importer. Actually, there are a lack of rules on how to importers will evidence their products are not made under forced labor conditions. So how the ministry can initiate an investigation. It could be by itself or they can launch one one uh, investigation based on a petition submitted by the Mexican citizens or Mexican legal entities. I think this is a, a very risky um, thing. The, the um, citizens or the legal entities in Mexico can ask for an investigation. So you can think the competitors may have some kind of evidence about forced labors against the other legal entities, and they can ask just to eliminate the competitors uh, for, an, for, an for an investigation. So even though they have to have evidence about this uh, forced labor issue, they gonna be many abuses in, in this kind of investigations. So we have to be prepared for this. And um, 
the next issue is the Mexican Ministry of Labor can initiate as as a um, as uh, 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 with an agreement. If, well, if there is an agreement with another country with another authority, they can ask the, the the other country the authority to conduct the investigation and the ministry in Mexico will accept the conclusion reached by these authorities. For example, um, if Mexico has an agreement with the customs or labor uh, authority from China, they can ask to conduct uh, um, an investigation and here in Mexico, the Ministry of Labor will accept this investigation as a fact. The other way is that if there is no agreement in place with uh, any ministry or any authority of all the other country, the ministry will conduct the investigation. The, the, the labor ministry is going to be conduct the investigation. Once the investigation starts, upon notification, the importer has 20 business days to respond with the evidence that its goods were not produced with forced labor. I think it's um, a short period of time, but maybe um, the rules will will uh, get uh, some many some other time. But let's let's see. Once the twenty day period has elapsed, the ministry will have one hundred eighty business day, with which can which may be extended for an additional one hundred eighty days to issue a determination on whether the goods are produced with forced labor. I, it's, it's more than a year to, to, to serve a resolution on, on, the, on, on these goods. In the meanwhile, the importer has the opportunity to, to continue importing the goods. Next, please. If the ministry conclude, concludes that forced labor has penetrated the supply chain, it will add the goods to a list published in its website and notify the Ministry of Economy so that, so that the goods will be prohibited for importation into Mexico. If the ministry does not issue a forced labor determination, the goods will be presumed not to be tamed. So, the presumption here in Mexico is that all goods are not in, in forced labor uh, uh, chain. The ministry have to conduct an investigation to prove that the goods are on forced labor uh, supply, supply chain spender. So the, the, the resolution will remain in effect as long as the importer does not demonstrate that the goods are not produced uh, with forced labor. The, the resolution does not contain any deadlines or rules for importance to review a forced labor allegation, so it will be necessary to resort to the USMCA and or Mexican law to ascertain uh, what legal remedies are available. That means there is no rules, there is no uh, due diligence uh, presumption. So we have to be very uh, 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 careful with these kind of things. Next, please. Insights. Mexican companies sourcing products are part directly or indirectly from an area known to engage in forced labor practices are exposed to legal and reputational risks. You know that, uh, especially in Mexico, uh, if you are uh, I'm, I'm Canadian or, or a U.S. legal entity with a maquila here in Mexico, you know that some of the raw materials or, uh, are going to, to came from maybe China, maybe other par parts of the world, in inclusive from Canada or, or U.S., so the the final wood is produced in Mexico, will produce in Mexico, is subject to forced labor rules in Canada or in US. So we have to take care of these 
kind of things here in Mexico. Maybe a resolution issued for a raw material affect the final wood that is going to return to the U.S. or Canada. I don't know. There is a lot of variants with the forced labor, and we have to uh, wait until the main ministry of labor here in Mexico uh, publish some rules to 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 allow the the importers to to evidence that the goods are not in the forced labor that the goods are in the forced labor compliance so thank you uh, everyone i'm here for any questions that you may have uh, next thank is you, yeah, Greco. Well, thank you very much i appreciate it uh, my name is andrea greco i'm a managing director and a leader in the supply chain practice of bdl I have over 25 years in supply chain in the corporate world uh, with large corporations, uh, managing suppliers and um, handling all the supply chain uh, strategies as well as the processes and systems in support of this area. Uh, I have to say, I, I looked at the uh, Q&A and the global representation is uh, uh, really impressive from from every part of the world. So good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you may be. And uh, we're happy you're here and uh, we're happy that we have the ability to share some information around this very important area. So um, in the next slide, um, my colleagues have eloquently spoken about the threats, uh, the risks, the regulations that force you to do these things, right? To look at your supply chain, to learn more about your suppliers, understand not just your direct suppliers, but tier two, tier three, all the way to the raw materials. Those are uh, very labor intensive and in some cases costly uh, propositions. Um, I'm here to talk to you about the fact that those are obviously important considerations because interrupting the flow of goods because of non-compliance could be uh, a business impact, significant business impact. But I want to talk about the opportunities that are behind supply chain transparency. So it is our point of view, and we're confident that improving supply chain transparency, looking into your supply chain deeper um, and resilience, so avoiding or mitigating the risks, unlocks improvement opportunities. And here are some of the opportunities why we're saying this. Um, identifying supply chain risk. So knowing where an interruption of your goods flow of goods could happen anywhere in the world, regardless of where you're buying your product from your direct supplier. Um, improving your supplier relationship and data management. Uh, if you are in procurement, if you are in supply chain, Knowing your suppliers is one of the most important things that you can do, both from a negotiation perspective, quality uh, improvement, uh, compliance clearly, and just in general, really building those relationships with your suppliers that are so critical to the success of the company. Uh, the third one is identification of supplier concentration. So, you know, you only have one supplier in tier two for that particular material. And that's very risky because if something happens to that supplier, then uh, there is a huge impact. In other cases, there is too much fragmentation. So your direct suppliers may be buying their products, their components from too many suppliers, and there is an opportunity to consolidate, concentrate that by getting better control over it as well as better pricing. And then um, demand planning, network design, and optimization obviously come only with understanding what your supply chain nodes are. So... Uh, in addition to having to do these things, because forced labor, child labor are terrible things uh, that we need to help the world get rid of, but there are opportunities that you can identify. And then the business benefits are really business continuity, cost efficiency, um, service level improvements, because you can accelerate your supply chain and get products to the customers faster. Proactive and respect and effective response to regulations, as we've seen in the previous uh, presentations, and finally risk mitigation. Ultimately, you know, we want to protect our revenues, 
we're going to protect extra costs that come from disruptions in the supply chain, uh, reputational risks. Uh, if everybody remembers the, uh, uh, I won't say the name of the uh, sneakers brand, in, uh, I think it was in the 90s, that was boycotted because they found child labor in their, uh, in their supply chain. Uh, and then obviously penalties that can make up that. Uh, next slide, please. So what are the key triggers for investing in supply chain transparency? From a supply chain perspective, if I am the CPO of the chief supply chain officer of a company, or if I'm involved in uh, any areas of compliance uh, and, and corporate responsibility, I want to look at these triggers to say, okay, it's time for me to invest in this in this transparency. Labor regulations, we, we uh, heard the ones from the US, from Canada, from Mexico. There are others in, uh, in the EU. So Germany uh, just passed the law for supply chain due diligence uh, uh, that, that are, you know, the clients are supposed to request from their suppliers. Second one is environmental regulation. So uh, scope three emission reporting and management requirements and then achieve sustainability corporate goals that have been announced by many CEOs and boards of directors in the past few years saying we're going to mitigate our carbon emission. A lot of those happen in down in the supply chain. So you have to identify and work with your suppliers to do that. And then finally, supply chain resilience, which is what we've talked about, painfully uh, uh, recent memory of the COVID disruptions in the supply chain and uh, dealers, car dealers without cars and, and uh, supermarkets without products, et cetera, et cetera, knowing where your supply chain is and what risks uh, may uh, incur helps you mitigate or, or prevent those, uh, those disruptions. Next slide, please. So what do you do? Uh, you know, all of this is great. There are opportunities, there are risks, there are threats, there are obligations, but what, how do you really start? The first one is really segmenting your suppliers uh, and assess the risk. And you can do that by geography, you can do it by amount of spend, you can do it by criticality to your business. So the most important suppliers where there will be a stop to your production if something happened. Uh, but you have to take your universal supplier and kind of narrow it down to those that are the most uh, uh, risky ones. Uh, for products, for business, for amount of spend or amount of business that you do with them. The second one is mapping, 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 understanding where your suppliers are, go from your tier one to your tier twos to your tier threes, as deep as necessary, depending on your goals and the regulations. For UFLPA, you have to go all the way to raw materials because that's the, uh, the, the interpretation of the law that customs is, is utilizing. And then finally, uh, once you have mapped them, you have to understand them. What are they doing? Are they compliant? Do they have forced labor in their supply chain? Uh, do they have procedures to mitigate the risks? Uh, do they have a business continuity plan? All those things are important for you to have confidence in the supply chain is resilient. Next slide, please. So here is a success story. Um, we were engaged, video was engaged by an importer uh, which sourced cotton medical gauze produced in China from U.S. originating cotton and yarn. So the, the, the raw materials went to China, they would produce it and then uh, bring it back. And they were actually produced in uh, Xinjiang and the finished goods in Hubei. Those are both uh, kind of hot spots from a, from a forced labor perspective. The uh, UFLPA specifically targets the uh, uh, goods that come from the Xinjiang region because the Uyghur population is uh, uh, concentrated there. And then, uh, so what we did was we, uh, we they asked us to vet the working conditions in both factories to make sure that there wasn't any, um, any forced labor in that supply chain. And so we uh, engaged with a Chinese law firm. You have to have partnership there because you can't just show up in, in China and go visit factories and, and do this kind of work without having a partner on the ground. We do. Um, together with them, we, there was an on-site review of the factory, an assessment of the internal controls and documentation, and then to have even more solid evidence, video reviewed affidavits from uh, yarn producer uh, and sources of raw cotton. We reviewed purchase orders, invoices, et cetera, et cetera, to really have a strong case 
for a uh, customer to say, hey, uh, we did this. We looked at the supply chain. Here is the evidence. And it's, this is not subject to the withhold uh, release order, which was the uh, uh, preceding uh, law on cotton products from that, area, uh, from that area. And so the business could continue without interruption. So this was a business case uh, and a success story that was done manually. Uh, we have now partnered with uh, the source map to automate this process, accelerate it, and add what we brought as DDO in terms of reporting, in terms of analysis, et cetera, in, a, in an automated way that makes it faster, cheaper, and more uh, sustainable over time, since we're talking about sustainability. Next slide, please. So we are confident that the, uh, these five elements are supply chain consulting on the understanding and real life, real world experience in managing complex global multinational supply chains together with the customs and international trade service knowledge that Dana and his team brings together. Uh, project management discipline, these are not easy projects. You can't just start them and without having a clear plan of where you wanna end up, what is the scope of it, et cetera. And then uh, we recently partnered with SourceMap from a technology standpoint, which as I said, brings all of this to life and makes it really possible, practical, uh, repeatable, and, uh, and faster. Uh, I try to do it manually at CBRE, I try to do it manually at Unisys, and it becomes very, very cumbersome because we're talking about enormous amount of data, many, many suppliers, and uh, a changing environment. So when you finish doing it manually, the next day it's already uh, obsolete and you have to start over. So that's, um, that's it from my side, I believe. Uh, so go to the next slide. So we wanted to open up, and we have a, a few minutes, I think, for uh, uh, Q&A. I don't know if there are any in the in the chat uh, that we can answer. I was looking at them, but I didn't see a specific uh, question. Do we have any questions that came in uh, before? Or you can ask or not. And while we're waiting, I just wanted to emphasize one thing that Andrea said. You know, I was involved in that success story, and doing this process manually is a nightmare. In addition to the unbelievable amount of fees that you may incur in trying to do this manually, the software component is really critical. But as a as a way of getting management's attention, we always suggest that companies take one high risk item, just one, and actually try and do the tracing manually, and see, then you'll see what I'm talking about, and it will give you solid information to present to management to maybe get them to escalate this on the priority list for compliance in your coming year's budget. Yeah, thank you, Damon. Um, we had some questions that had come in prior uh, to the call. And so I'm, I'm gonna, uh, we, could, we have time to answer a couple of them. We'll obviously answer any other questions offline uh, if you want to reach out after the presentation. So one of them was, should I consider moving operations out of China? Uh, that is a, how many trillion dollars is the uh, GDP of China? Uh, and how much of our GDP comes from China? I think it's a very hard question. I don't know that we'll ever, and I'm not an expert in this, so I'm, I'm giving you my perspective from a supply chain uh, practitioner perspective. Uh, when I was at FILA and was managing the supply chain, we had product that came from, from countries where for a period of a month, it was only a question whether 50% of the country was underwater or 80% of the country was underwater. And it was always a, a, a race for you know beating the monsoons and getting the product out of there in order to make it. Um, I went to the product people, the marketing people, and I said, why don't we make these things closer? somewhere different and the answer is money people want to buy products that cost 9.99 you're not going to make them in the US to make them for 9.99 um, but there are also a lot of, of negative aspects of it so i do not think personally that you can get out of china completely but we should you should definitely review your operations and understand where your supply chain is 
Um, and if it's if in the Xinjiang area, you got to put a big magnifying lens on those suppliers and understand and being able to answer the questions when they come. Um, and, and from where I sit, I'll just and one of the one other aspect that's that's actually driven the flight from China and it's a, it's a customs issue started with the Trump tariffs as you, as people call them, you know the trade remedy tariffs that were levied on goods of Chinese origin and that was in 2018. So really for the past five years, companies have been looking to get out of China mainly for that reason. Now we have the forced labor issue on top of it, but as Andrea said, I mean it's a it's a multifaceted type of issue which has a lot of considerations, but companies are obviously have individual supply chains that need to be considered. And from where I sit, I am seeing a lot of companies moving to Vietnam. That is one comp that is one country that seems to be benefiting from all of this. Uh, yeah. Companies are are moving to Vietnam rapidly. Yeah. So the answer to that question is yes, if you can. But if you can't, make sure you know what your risks are and try to mitigate them. You know, have the answer, have an, alter an alternative, have a plan B, because uh, things are not going to stop happening with uh, with China. And uh, they may become even more uh, serious and tense, which then puts a strain in international partners. Um, and, and for those of you, one other update, for, for those of you that are continuing to pay those punitive tariffs, 25% for most goods, um, there is going to be an update announced very shortly here by the U.S. Trade Representative's Office. Um, actions have been taken, and we understand that some of those tariffs are going to be reduced or eliminated on a wide range of products. In addition, some are going to be increased from 25% to what we're hearing is 200 and 250% duties. <laughs> so stay tuned. You'll hear more about that. We have a BDO trade alert that you can sign up for at BDO.com, and you'll get the latest updates on that. Yeah. I want to answer a question that came and says that a lot of materials are imported into Vietnam from China. So yet yeah, you move to China and you say I'm gonna you move to Vietnam and you say I'm gonna buy from Vietnam. Question is where are they buying the raw materials? Where are they buying the components from? Where are they coming? Which is the whole point of mapping, right? Because you never have that visibility unless you do this type of thing. Uh, the other what you said, Damon brought up to mind another opportunity. You know there are benefits and incentives. Uh, now, in many countries, the U.S. specifically, for domestic production, for you know, moving uh, production out of certain countries. So there is tax benefits, there is tariffs benefits, uh, there are incentives that can be taken. So this area is changing daily, and my recommendation to all of us is you need to stay on top of it. You need to understand your supply chain so that you can both mitigate the risk and take those opportunities that uh, we talked about. I do think we are, oh no, we still have a few minutes. Andrea, if I can just make one point here, I, I think it's sure. very important that all levels of the organization understand what's going on, the potential liabilities. This isn't something that can just be housed under the customs umbrella of an organization. This has to go right into the boardrooms and everybody needs to be talking about it. And it doesn't matter what country uh, you're in. Right, as yeah. an example, Charmaine, you mentioned the PIP program, CTPAT. We in the customs world and the trade compliance professionals that are on the front line understand the enormous benefits that that can offer to a company. They're on the front line dealing with that every day. But communicating the importance of those benefits to upper management can also be problematic until those benefits are gone. <laughs> and then it will go right to the boardroom. And I think that's something that I can't emphasize enough. Customs tends to labor in the shadows until the crisis erupts. And then all of a sudden, companies are asking, how did we get here? Why did we get here? And I think the trade compliance folks do as much as they can with the budgets that they have, which in many cases are very limited. But this really is beyond customs. It's a supply chain issue. It's a it's an operational issue. It's a reputational issue. And so this really should be front and center of the C-suite discussions uh, going forward. Because as we've all said today, and I think everybody here understands, this is this is not going away, and this will be a permanent part of your business changes, just as it has been a permanent change in the way U.S. customs operates and in the way the agencies in Canada and Mexico operate and the European Union. I know a lot of the folks on this call are in the EU. A lot of changes there. I spent a lot of time in Germany. Andrea mentioned the new German Supply Chain Act. I mean, all of that is really 
coming all together now. Um, and I think it's time for companies to pay attention and really get their game plan together, including the budget. Thank you, David. Um, I'm seeing a lot of incredible, I'm having trouble picking the questions to answer. Uh, can we capture these and uh, answer them offline? Uh, if I can ask the, the uh, organizers to make sure we capture those, uh, those questions. Um, there was one that I wanted to answer because I think it's very relevant since we have where source maps gets, which is how do you evaluate technology? Uh, for, I guess, supply chain or just supply chain transparency. So I, my experience has been the first thing to do is make sure that you know your requirements, not just from one functional perspective, but you get multiple perspectives. So you go to, you spoke to you, you speak to your custom compliance people, to your IT uh, function, to your finance function, to your legal uh, department and understand what it is that that technology is supposed to do. Um, because otherwise you don't have anything to compare or evaluate on. And then uh, go out and get yourself educated on what are the solutions uh, around supply chain mapping, supply chain transparency. What I find is that there is a lot of fragmentation. So there are companies that will do one piece of it. They will do the risk assessment. They will do the... Uh, uh, external source uh, importing so that you get alerts when something happens in, in a country or when something happens to a company. Um, that may be adequate for what your company specifically needs, but it, it may not be. Um, so if you don't get those perspectives, you look at it from your functional point, standpoint, and you miss a lot of opportunities of risk that are there. Um, and then go out in the market uh, and research the companies that do that, invite them, the ones that Pique your interest, invite them, talk to them, have them do a demo. Uh, and then I usually, when I was managing these things, I would ask them, I would create use cases and say, okay, this is what we want to do. Here is a use case. Show me what your product can do uh, to, to solve my, my issue or to answer my, my question. Uh, and then you have them presented to you. Um, and when you, when you see it, you'll know which one is the right one usually that comes down to two or three and then and then you have uh, your colleagues help you make the decision uh, so that was uh, an interesting question that's very very relevant here uh, we have a question for the experts here uh, what new regulations should we be worried about in 2024 and beyond uh, damon do you have a point of view on that well in terms of new regulations for from the u.s side we already have the law the ufulpa Usually when we have a law, it's accompanied by implementing regulations, which which are sort of taking place in a different format with customs because it's it's an unusual law. But I don't think from where we sit, we're going to have anything new in the way of regulations. We're just going to have more enforcement. There'll be more news items. And again, we're waiting for the Senate Finance Committee report to see what that says. We, we do actually work with a lot of companies in the automotive industry. So that's going to be very important to see what the Senate uh, report discloses and how the, the future enforcement is gonna change as a result of that report. Thank you, David. Uh, Charmaine or Guillermo, what about uh, your respective countries? Where do you see this going? Yeah, so I'm actually gonna answer and I'm gonna tick off another question that came in as well at the same time. So as I said, S211 um, becomes enacted or is in force as of January 1, 2024. And because there's two pieces of it, there's the piece of the the report for you know government entities or entities with X amount of global revenue that have to file this report, but the other piece uh, affects every importer, big or small. And that was the question. And a lot of what we're talking about today seems to impact big importers, but certainly in Canada, um, the enforcement uh, at the border to ensure that no goods are coming in with forced or child labor is going to ramp up. And I'm not going to speak for Damon, but uh, I, I would say that in the U.S. that is the same. It, it's not big or small. It covers them all. Thank you, Charmaine. Um, it is almost the top of the hour, so I want to leave time to thank all of you for uh, your participation. Great answers. 
great questions, actually. The answers, I don't know. You will be the judge of that. Uh, but we uh, remain uh, uh, available to answer any questions. You can reach us through the uh, meeting organizers, uh, through SourceMap. And we look forward to maybe meeting some of you and, and talking about uh, some of the opportunities in your supply chain.